Um, okay. All right. Yes. Should I take it away? With Daniele and Ophelia thanking your service, um, supporting our community. And of course, thank you Canonical for, for supporting us as well. Um, I just wanted to mention that we are part of the Python community and we have the Python community code of conduct. I should have the link somewhere or if somebody has it. But I think be friendly, be welcoming. And if anybody has issues, do reach out to one of us and we will refer you to the code of conduct um, working group. Um, also want to thank Cam and Ned for helping me with organizing this workshop. Um, yeah, I think maybe we can get started unless anybody else has something else they want to okay. say. All right, let's, let's go. Let's, let's, let's kick off because these sessions inevitably, you know, they could go on for three hours quite easily if, uh, um, uh, if anybody could stand it. So I'm, I'm going to try and keep it uh, compact and try and give you as much uh, time as possible to be active in the sessions because I, because I think that's really important for what we're doing. So this is one of two sessions. This is um, uh, an introduction to the, the Ataxis uh, framework. Um, and let me see if I've got my controls all working. And, oh, magic. Okay, so um, I know that some of you know me already. Um, that's what I look like on television. Um, I'm a director of engineering at um, Canonical. Um, I'm, I've kind of grown up in software in the Python ecosystem, Python and, and Django. Um, uh, and one of the things that um, I've done a lot of work in is the African Python movement, which has, of course, been disrupted by the last couple of years of plague, but I'm hoping that's all going to be starting uh, up again. So there, I, I meet many of you and see many of you online, different places and, and different ways. And um, that's been an important to me over the last um, 13 years or so. Um, I'm in Cardiff, UK right now. I also live sometimes in Leiden in the Netherlands. Oh, and I should say I'm a director of engineering at Canonical, not the director of engineering, I'm a director of engineering. Um, and I'm actually unique amongst the directors because I don't have responsibility for a product or project. I'm responsible for um, the company's documentation practice, the way we think about um, the way we do documentation, the standards, the methods, the processes, all the way we think uh, and do, uh, all, the, all, all the things that we think and do when, when it comes to uh, documentation. So, um, uh, if you, on the bottom left, I'm going to share these slides with you, by the way, there's a, um, afterwards, um, there's a link there to uh, an article about the documentation strategy that I've introduced at Canonical, and it's an answer to the question, well, how, how are we going to get to this vision of documentation? There, there are four pillars of it, and we're going to cover two of them in these two workshops. Today, it's about um, direction, how, how, where, where are we going, in other words, um, the standards, what we're aiming for. And um, on Thursday, it'll be about execution, how we actually do the work that we're doing when we're, when we're actually working, when, when we've got our hands in the work itself. The other two pillars of this strategy, strategy um, don't really apply uh, here, although they do for um, canonical. Um, this is a workshop, it's not a lecture, so um, I want to do as little talking as possible, much as I love the sound of my own voice. Um, I'm going to skip over some stuff like some of the theoretical background of the Ataxis. Um, please use the chat. I'll try and scroll back up it sometimes when I can. It's good if you have your cameras on, if you can stand that, because then people can see each other and interact with each other well. Um, it's good if you have your phones and other distractions off so you can uh, focus on this because I, I want to have as much interaction as possible. Um, we'll be looking at um, 
information architecture for documentation, how the data access system works to apply to that, how it works for uh, documentation problems and for your problems and your work. Um, and we'll be get, I'll do a bit of introduction, we'll have some discussion, exercises and so on. We'll, I want to hear about your problems, but those things will all be interwoven with each other, although I will kick off with a bit of a kind of talking head stuff first. Um, the ataxis.fr is the website for the framework, FR being the international top level domain for frameworks. Um, so let's get in. Um, the I've been working in documentation for quite a while, and um, unlike much of the rest of software, there doesn't seem to be nearly as much discipline and methodology around it. But certain problems are very clear, uh, are always appearing again and again. And um, they usually, they're different kinds of problems, but they very often manifest themselves as problems related to structure about what to write and where to put it, um, and how to organize the whole. Um, uh, and that's a problem for maintainers and for users. It can also be a troublesome thing because they never seem to know where they're supposed to be in the documentation when they are um, looking for things. And the way I think to solve this problem is just simply to stop thinking uh, about documentation actually, and to think instead about the needs of um, uh, of its users. So to reframe questions about documentation structure by foregrounding user need. And my insight, if you can call it that, is that, you know, we talk about documentation and we approach documentation as though it were fundamentally one thing that we then divide up into different sections for convenience or for whatever other reason. It's not really like that. It's not one thing. It's four really completely distinct kinds of things. And those four things are tutorials, how-to guides, reference, and explanation. They're four, um, they're four modes of documentation. They're actually, you know, documentation is not just the stuff we produce, um, to document is also a verb. So the activity of documentation um, has four different, includes four different kinds of ac activity. So these are four modes or types or forms or components of, um, of documentation. And what's important about them is that they represent four different objectives or functions because they serve four different needs of the user. But as I said, it's the user that's at the heart of all this. Um, the structure that we get emerges from an understanding of what users are, what they're doing, and what their needs are. So um, I think that a complete set of documentation for a product needs to contain each of these in some way and should be, at some level, um, structured explicitly um, according to this scheme. And each of these things has its own style of writing, each has its own purpose, each answers a different need, uh, each has its own thing to do, and each should be kept distinct from the others. And that's one of the questions I want to explore a little bit during this, um, during this session. Um, the way to understand, I think, documentation is as material that serves practitioners of a technical skill or craft, which could be, for example, the use of a product or the use of a language, or it could be something wider, like even, you know, programming in general. Th those things are all skills or crafts. But successful exercise of any craft, and we can talk, you know, it could be carpentry, it could be cooking, it could be programming in, in Python, uh, involves both theoretical grasp for knowledge and understanding, stuff that goes on in, in the head, and the ability to apply that craft in practice with the hands using the tools and the materials of that craft. So documentation 
has to answer to both of those. Um, it has to um, it has to help with the theoretical and the practical aspects of a craft. Also, it has to serve the user when they are acquiring their craft, their competence in the craft, when they are building and developing their skills, and on the other hand, when they are um, applying those skills to work. So we have a distinction between, on one hand, between study, acquisition, and um, work, application of skill. So if we frame the user of, a cra of every single craft that there is, ever has been, and always will be, according to those two dimensions of theoretical and practical and study and work, which I think is a possible thing to do, then we get something that's this two-dimensional uh, map, two axes of, of knowledge or two, um, two axes of, of skill, the theoretical and the practical work and, and study and, and work. So if we're going to serve the needs of the person who is we've just described, it also gives us a picture of the documentation that will serve those needs. So we've got this kind of arrangement. This is where the name, the ataxis, comes from. I, I don't suppose there are any ancient Greeks here, but in ancient Greek, it means something like arrangement across or, or, or layout. So um, if we look at very briefly at these um, four here, um, consider the user who is learning basic competence in a skill. And don't just think about programming or Python, think about you know, something very concrete, if you like, like bicycling or, or flying or singing, it doesn't matter. The user needs to learn basic competence and a tutorial um, meets that need by teaching the skill. And the tutorial, as you can see, will be composed of practical steps that serve the um, user's study, their acquisition of the skill. The how-to guide is um, what someone needs to help them apply their skill to solve actual problems, to get work done. And it does that by showing them the steps that they need to take. Um, reference material also serves work, but it doesn't guide them in what to do. It just gives them the information, the accurate, accurate information they need. And then finally, every practitioner of a craft needs to understand their craft in, 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 in depth and context. And that's what explanation provides. It's, um, it's serving study rather than work. Um, and it's about theory, the stuff that goes on inside the head rather than with the hands. Now, people do like this structure of diataxis. It's, it's nice and clear, but it does not represent four parts of documentation. These are not four boxes into which you must at all costs stuff every kind of documentation. That's not how it works. It's a way of thinking about the needs of the user and how we might meet those needs. What exactly we're going to do to, in an actual piece of documentation to meet those needs, well, we have to work that out. But these are the four kinds of material that will meet those needs. So it's a way of thinking about how we write and what we write and why we're writing it rather than four boxes in, into which to stuff things. So let's, um, oh, I tell you what, let, let's actually try it. But while I'm fooling around with my um, browser up here, um, let's see if um, anyone's got any questions that they want to ask about that. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just start. Uh, my internet connection did recover, so okay. with Cam even. Um, I'm wondering, I think, Correct me if I'm wrong. It was you, Daniele, who did a pull request or multiple multiple to PyTest organi reorganizing their documentation. Yes, I did. And there, I think, I'm not sure if this part was you as well, but we ended up uh, somehow, even in the documentation index, kind of having sections about this is reference, this is tutorial, this is how to. Yes, which seems like it would be contrary to what it just said about those not really being four boxes. Well, what I'm no, what I'm, I'm I think that um, very often documentation will literally have that structure, 
but they're not boxes, empty boxes waiting for you to put things into. They are um, four kinds of different things that you must, not, that you should be creating. And if that's what you are creating, and if that's, if these are the four kinds of documentation that need, that makes sense and should be kept separate from each other, then in most cases, you will find that the documentation is structured around that explicitly in the index. Mm -hmm. By the way, can you tell me what you see on my screen or what, what, what I'm sharing right now? I'm not sure exactly. The threats. Fantastic. Slide. Okay, great, 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 great. And uh, nothing else. So, you know, that, that, that's, did, did I answer your question sufficiently? Yes, you did. You did. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I have another one that is related with what he said already, uh, I, because I thought the same when you mentioned that. And I, I was thinking that also it's not just to put the documents into a box. But also, as you said, like when you start writing a document, you start thinking about if it's going to be a story or a how to explanation or reference. And depending on that, you use a different technique while you are writing it. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Yes. And, you know, that's orthogonal to the question about are you going to put it in here? I mean, probably if you're writing a how to guides, it makes sense. To have the how-to guides together, not scattered. But uh, let's start actually question. by making sure that we're writing how-to guides in the right kind of way. A, a related question I have is, I think, around the thought of like, when you're writing a tutorial, there is some level of explanation that you want to do, so like enough to have them orient. Uh, and then I feel like there's knowing when to switch between that to like cross-linking to like high-level concepts. Let me um, let me address that when we've done, we're going to run through a little exercise now and I'm going to answer exactly, uh, try and address exactly that question. Is that okay? Great, okay. Um, all right, so look, on the right hand side of here, you should have, see the little map, tutorial, how to guide, reference and explanation. I'm going to show you a series of situations or bits of writing or even questions or whatever whatever they are they're a di bunch of different things um and i want you uh, oh i need to share this uh, document with you damn sorry I, uh, I need to give you the link um let me give you that link i'm going to paste you all need access you i'm going to paste this in the chat okay um surprised to see a slide labeled threads in a python group it's provocative so you should be able to jump into there. And what you should be able to do is, uh, if you can see this, you know, if you think that this thing here is a tutorial, just put your initial or your first initial or something like that. So we can just kind of collect, collect some votes on that. Is there, can there people get into this? Yes, you can. Fantastic. So I'm going to make this full size again. So um, what is uh this do you think that this is a does it feel does it smell does it sound like tutorial how to explanation or reference just quickly don't take we'll take a few seconds over each one i mean if you want to say something about it do so but let's not spend too long on this just go ahead and stick your vote into each slot and of course i think i cannot be uh, um yeah Yeah, stick it in, in, in the pink parts. That makes it slightly easier to read. Um, okay. All right, well, I, I, th I think that mostly people seem to think it's reference and I agree with that. Um, somebody who thought it was, feels it's tutorial. Why, why do you think it's tutorial? Why does it seem like tutorial to you? I said tutorial because it's, typically and for example, rather than definitive. Mm -hmm. Although maybe it is meant to be definitive. I, maybe I misread except as there, for example. Oh, this is Jim. The reason why I said tutorials because it doesn't explain why those threads would be left-handed and most would be right-handed. In an explanation, I would expect there to be an explanation of why that difference. Yeah. When I, I can't remember, 
did I say I thought it was reference a few seconds ago? Uh, it, I, I, th I think it's explanation, okay? And I think it's explanation because, you know, it's not definitive reference. I don't think, and actually, let me, let's skip on. I'll tell you why I think those things later. We could, that's more interesting. Okay, what's this? Uh, if you can see it, can you see that clearly enough? Does that look to you like how to explanation or reference? Some of these are much more obvious and intuitive than the others. And you'll have a chance to go back and look at some of these in, 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 in due course as well. Okay, so we've got a kind of equal split between tutorial and how to. Uh, nobody seems to think it might be explanation or, or reference. Uh, let's go on to another one. Um, somebody goes up to their parent and says, oh, the button has come off my pyjamas or, or, or my, my button has come from, off my shirt. Can you sew it back on for me, please? And the parent says, no, but if you bring it here, I'll show you how to do it yourself. Um, by the way, please, I, is there a raise a hand button in, in this thing? I'm not sure if there is, but there is. if anybody wants to raise a hand, just raise a hand or talk or something. I'm always happy to hear people's thoughts and questions, okay? Um, yeah, I have a question actually. So this this exercise here is to classify the text itself, or or the things that ha happens after the text, because the text doesn't seem either to me. But well, no, I you're... mean it's a, it's a situation. Is does it does this situation look like the situation that will take us into a tutorial or into? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. they're not, they're not always texts. Not all of them. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, toothbrush. Okay, so I bought an electric toothbrush. I've got no idea whether it's better for me to leave it charging all the time or some of the time or only when the battery's low. I want to know that. So what do I want? Do I want, do I want tutorial, reference, how-to, or explanation? I... Yeah, it's, you will notice over and over again that it's much easier to choose between the practical and the theoretical than it is between the study and the work sides. And we'll come on to that. Here's the last one. This is uh, one of the, you can see it's a, it's a camera. Marvelous. Okay, great. So, um, I'll tell you what I think, just so you can, we can compare notes. I think this is explanation. And I think it's explanation because it's not, it's not telling, a tutorial would tell me how, would, would take me through some steps, would give me a lesson. And this isn't a lesson. It's clearly not a how-to guide. I don't think it's reference because it's not definitive. It's just talking about the subject. It says most, typically, except for some. You know, it's, it's giving me some context, but it's not reliable, like, uh, you know, think about if the API documentation said, well, sometimes you'll get such and such a response. That wouldn't be very useful. Um, I think this is a how-to guide because it's not teaching you the art of wardrobe building, it's not giving you a lesson in building war wardrobes. It's how to build this particular wardrobe. Oh, Barry's got a hand up. I, I don't know how you found that button, but yeah, Barry. It, uh, yeah, it's under reactions, actually. Uh, were you, you're talking about the camera uh, slide, right? Uh, uh, the, the wardrobe reason I, slide. Oh, the wardrobe slide, sorry. I'm, uh, uh, let me go back. Okay. Never mind then. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll catch up. We'll catch up to the camera one in a second then. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the button. Okay. This was evenly divided between tutorials and how to. I think that this situation calls for a tutorial because this is somebody who wants, who doesn't have a skill, and the the other person is offering to teach them that skill. But it, the, the person literally said how to. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, but they're not going to say, 
um, they're going to they're going to sit there with the child or whatever. Say, okay, this is how you take the thread, and, and, and you know you've got to get it in there, and you you can lick the thread. They're going to be showing them these things. They're not going to be saying, okay, well, take a size such and such needle and do a a, a stitch of that has this net. You know, I don't even know anything about sewing. A stitch of this name that would be more. Uh, um, that would be about applying someone's sewing skills to a particular job, whereas in this case, it's about acquiring the the very basic so, skill of sewing. So it seems like one of the separations between the tutorials and the how to is this sort of level of experience of the person doing it. So it's it, it's actually not. Okay. It's, we'll come on to that. We'll come on to that later. It's actually okay. really importantly completely separate from level of experience. It's about the situation that we're in and that the tutorial is in the hands of a tutor whereas the as how to guide a guide is for actual work and i'll give you some examples shortly about why experience there is not relevant to it okay um the toothbrush okay i think this one would be explanation because I want to understand the context of ba of rechargeable batteries. I want to know what's good for them in general. Reference would be that it takes two and a half hours to charge, but I, I'm not. I know how to charge it. I'm not trying to get something done. I just want to know a little bit more because I'm confused. All the this is just going to go on in my head. Um, I'm not saying. Um, I'm not asking what I should do. I just want to know whether it's better to do it this way or that way. And if you read up about this stuff, people might actually have different opinions about this. And but we'll again, um, we'll when we look into the mechanics of the system, I think it will become clearer. And most people thought this was reference, and I agree. It's. It, when I'm taking apart a camera, that's what I have in front of me, saying, shit, how do these pieces fit back to, to together again? Um, it's not explaining anything to me. It's not, it's just giving me some information that I have to interpret. <coughs> Let's continue. I, I, th I think now this is the part where I'm going to be able to answer some of your, some of those things that you've, um, uh, race and some of the doubts that have have come up. Um, let's put this over there, and I should find out how to make this full screen again. Full screen, good. Okay, so this is our 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 pattern. I'm going to start with talking about tutorials. I'm going to talk far more about tutorials than anything else because they're by far the most difficult part, and they take up most of the time. So a tutorial on um, answers to a user's need to learn basic skills by providing a lesson. Oh, and all my examples here are from food and cooking, okay? So, tutorial is a lesson that takes the reader by the hand through a series of practical steps to complete some kind of project or meaningful exercise. So, a tutorial, a lesson, is an experience. That's a really key thing. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. You were asking me about the, the uh, fair Neil. Florian. Um, oh, well, I think a couple of people asked this, in fact, then. You know, it's, it's oh, sorry. You know, you know it's, it's, that's fine. The tutorial creates an experience. You know, that, 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 that the, the how-to guide for assembling the IKEA wardrobe. IKEA don't want to give you IKEA wardrobe assembling experiences. They just want to help you assemble the damn wardrobe. Yeah. Whereas the tutorial is not about the end result is about the experience that you have or that you give. So it's not the purpose of the tutorial to show someone how to accomplish a task. It is to provide a learning experience. So I don't know if uh, um, some of you may have children, maybe you have the experience or, or nieces and nephews, maybe you have the experience of teaching a child to cook or to do something in the kitchen. And you'll know what you teach is not important, and especially if the child is quite young. Uh, whether the child remembers anything you showed them is not important. It doesn't matter what actually comes out 
at the end. It doesn't matter if you showed the right or the wrong way to do it, you know, the technically correct way. It doesn't matter if you skipped over some steps or even important parts of the explanation. None of those things matter at all in a tutorial. The only thing that matters in this in the kitchen is that the child finds it enjoyable. They feel that they accomplished something. They feel, not that they did accomplish something, they feel they did, that they gain confidence in themselves, in you, in being in the kitchen, and they want to do it again. They've taken a step forward. They've had an experience, a learning experience that built something in them. And what's important in the experience is um, uh, that they want to come back to it. So think now about any skill at all that you have. How did you learn it? And if it's a skill, I'm not talking about merely theoretical knowledge, you learn that skill by doing it. And a tutorial has to find a way to create an experience in which people do things through which they learn. So what we're teaching the child in the kitchen is not to make a particular dish or even a particular technique. We're teaching at the lowest level, the basic habits, practices and principles that make it possible for them to be in the kitchen safely and effectively. So they learn things like to wash their hands before touching the food, how to hold a knife, how to control heat. That's what we're trying to teach when the child's in the kitchen with us. We're laying down this groundwork for all the future kitchen activities that they will have. So it's their first step in becoming a cook. The tutorial for our products or our software have the same role of building confidence, building up these layers step by step through repetition, often, of basic skills. You know, the hygiene of washing your hands, the hygiene of, um, I don't know, using SSH or something like like that. Barry, yeah. Um, would, you, would you say that tutorials are sort of geared towards uh, beginners in the topic. So in other words, washing your hands, right? Or knowing how to sharpen a knife, mm. right? Those are things that if I don't know how to cook, I'm gonna be like, I would love to learn how, how you know, sort of go through the tutorials about basic cooking skills. But once I've sort of done that enough, those are ingrained in me and I might interact with the tutorials much less often, right? Um, I may still need, you know, help in, in certain areas where I'm, I'm not familiar, but I'm going to start to uh, have those lessons ingrained in, into me, and they're just going to be part of my muscle memory as I interact with whatever system. Um, you're, you're, we don't get, we, you know, you said something really important there about muscle memory. Tutorials work through the body, even software tutorials. Yeah, they're yeah. About, they're about where we type something, where we save something, where we put something, where we paste something. And it's when somebody's doing something physical, it's really obvious that they're building up muscle memory. But even in software, tutorials rely on building up muscle memory because they're the foundation for this other stuff. Yeah, thanks. That makes sense. Um, let's move on. Um, so tutorials are learning oriented. We have to provide a learning experience. Your task, your only task is to create this learning experience in which the pupil will do something We'll, well, sorry, we'll learn something by doing things under your uh, direction. It takes place safely in the hands of the instructor. And a good tutorial is repeatable. It instills confidence. It results in success every time for every learner in every situation. And it has to be concrete and particular. It's do this with that right here. When you're in the kitchen with a child, you say, Okay, take that knife and that carrot and put it on that chopping board and cut it into seven pieces. It's, you're not talking about technique, you're talking about what they are literally doing with their hands right now in this moment. And there are all these anti, by the way, oh, I used to be, um, I used to be an actual high school teacher. So I do know a little bit about pedagogy. And some of this comes out of that uh, experience. There are these anti-pedagogical temptations. For example, um, you know, the, the most powerful things in, in programming are abstraction and generalization. They don't belong in tutorials. So resist that urge. Resist the urge to expl explain or to offer choices or to give information. We, you will feel real urges to do all of those things in your tutorials. And 
the only thing they will do is weaken your tutorials. And people, sometimes people resist this, you know, they can't bear the idea of not explaining or, you know, when I say not explain, you say, okay, you hold the knife like this so that you don't cut yourself. Oh, let's wash our hands because we need to have clean hands so we don't get uh, germs on our food. That's, the, that's the, the kind of level of explanation that I'm talking about. It. That's okay. More than that is going beyond the bounds. Let's say you're in the kitchen with a, a child making scrambled eggs. You say, okay, let's take the heat, the heat, the pan off the heat now. You don't say, ah, now observe the pan. The proteins in the egg are starting to coagulate. That's that's not part of the learning experience of scrambling eggs. That's unhelpful at that moment. Uh, yeah, Barry and uh, go ahead, Barry. I think you were you were first. Um, is this sort of like? thinking about the happy path. So we, we use that term a lot where you're, tr you're trying to do something and there's a happy path, right? Like there's a, there's, this is where we're very opinionated about what we're trying to teach you. And we're gonna take you along this, this, this path, assuming success at every step. Now, of course we know how messy software is, but we're not, we're not gonna talk about that. We wanna drive people down that happy path. Okay, I don't think I'd even heard that term before, but I actually have, uh, I can share it with you later. It's called the one true path. The word path is absolutely right. It's a learning journey. And the path in, in software has to take the user on a little journey. It's like a, imagine you're writing a story in which they are the protagonist, in which they're going to encounter the bad guys and the good guys and the tools and the wisdom. And they're going to encounter the challenge and they're going to get over the challenge. And at every step, another thing you said just now, they're going to have success. Every step is a visible step forward for them along this journey. And it's a completely made up journey. You're, you've made up a story for them to be the, the winner in. Um, yeah, Barry, thank you. That was absolutely right. Um, some, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but you have a question. Uh, Rulge works. Rulge. Okay. Um, what about in the tutorial? What about linking out to linking out to the explanation so it's not part of the tutorial but they're, they're more interested in it leave that out entirely was your suggestion no. I'm assuming? links link early and link often because it takes all the pressure off you if okay. somebody wants that context they can find it they they know that it's something else it's not going to interrupt their work right now so it takes pressure off everybody and i think it's a really good thing to do okay yeah um so um, the, your, only pre, pre, your only preoccupation in the tutorial, what is your pupil, and that's how you must think of them, what is your pupil going to do in order that they shall learn? So you've got to make it so that they can make mistakes safely. They can always recover from, from typing the wrong thing somehow, if that's possible. They can, if they're going to solve problems or face challenges that can only be ones that you know they're going to be able to solve. They need to be able maybe to play or experiment safely because you're creating this learning environment. And it's really tough to do this because people want to teach as though it's something you do to somebody, but I, I hardly believe in teaching anymore. I think all you can do is just create situations where uh, people learn. People, you know, they're, oh, so-and-so is great. You, you heard the expression that um, uh, repetition is a good teacher, right? Well, I don't think that's right. I think that repetition is the only teacher. That's how we learn a skill by doing it over and over again. So, and, and that people will come back to your tutorials over and over again, by the way, they'll do them because if, if, they're, if they're well written. Anyway, so we're not trying to do something to the students. We're trying to give them this learning experience. And I can really safely tell you that tutorials are the least well understood part of documentation, the most difficult part to create and maintain and write. Uh, they're the most badly written part of uh, any documentation that you'll find. And it should be clear that a lesson in the form of a written tutorial is condemned to be suboptimal because a tutorial implies a tutor and you are condemned to be absent from that lesson. You've somehow got to put yourself in the written material that you're creating. It's so hard. You're responsible for the, you, not the 
pupil, you're responsible for their success. You're responsible for their learning. You're responsible for giving them a safe, confidence inspiring experience. And at the same time, you're not even allowed to be in the same room as them. So that's, if you think that sounds unfair, I agree with you, but that's, that's tough luck. That's just how, that's the life of somebody writing tutorials. And, you know, it should take about 80% of your time and energy on documentation that 80% of that time should be spent on tutorials and probably something like 99% of the time that you spend crying should be over the tutorials. Adam, you've got a quick question. Sorry, just a quick question. Just so I understand the distinction of it better. It seems like the tutorials are geared towards an experience, not necessarily. But could it be possible to do both where we also providing experience, but then the product is useful I'm, towards the project. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm simply not hearing you well enough to uh, answer your question, but if you type oh, it so in, sorry. In, the in the chat, I'll try and answer it in a few moments, if that's okay. Yeah. Is that better by any chance? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. It, it went to my AirPods by accident. Um, so just to reiterate, um, just to understand the distinction better, it seems like a tutorial is more geared towards an experience, whereas um, a how-to guide is for an end product or end goal. Would it be possible to combine the two where we have an experience, but at the end of that experience, there is some tangible um, product or goal that we're working towards? Well, you know, in the kitchen with the child, you hope that you're going to come out with a, uh, a meal. But... If, if you make the child, what the child produces a criterion of success, everybody's going to be disappointed. If the five-year-old chops up a few carrots and then lose, you know, how short their attention spans are and, and then they wander off and go and do something else. And then people sit down for the meal and say, when they're eating the salad, somebody says, oh, these are the, I've never tasted such good carrots in this salad. That's mission accomplished. That, that's closing the loop of the tutorial. And that's, you know, you just build it up one step at a time. That's fine for now. Of course, it's help. You know, if you're relying that, that the child is going to be helping you in the kitchen rather than actually taking up more of your energy when you're teaching them. No, you're, you, you're it's not going to work. Hmm. When, okay. when you're being a teacher, you're, you know that real work is not the output of this. The output of the out the outcome of this is is the is the pupil's learning, and everything must be based around that. Otherwise, you let the the pupil down. Mm, okay, I'm gonna chew on that yeah. for a bit. <laughs> well, 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 you know, please, yeah, and and maybe the, the the next this will will help. So, how to guides now? This is okay. Everything is very easy from now on by comparison. We've done the hard bit. These are how to guides answer the user's need to, to get something done by showing them how to do it. It's about the application of knowledge to work. It's, it's about work, not about study, through practical steps. So if you want the perfect example of a how-to guide, it's a recipe, literally a recipe for cooking. So um, the how-to guide takes the readers, takes the reader through these steps to complete some specific or more or less specific task or some more or less particular problem. So how-to guides are recipes, thinking about a recipe for preparing a dish what's the function of recipe that is the outcome you know if you don't get a cake out of this recipe you will be disappointed um what about the fa the, the form of a recipe that well it's it's fairly standard uh, the forms what's out of place what do you expect to find in a recipe and what not and think about how to guides in software what do you expect to find in them and not you know in recipes nowadays they, nobody seems to think they're complete unless they've got the story of the uh, the author's grandmother and how she used to make this dish in her village 50 years ago and that's nothing to do with the recipe that's color that's not going to help you make it um so how to guys like recipes have a kind of form a standardized form and a purpose and um i think the the recipe you know how to guys literally are recipes for, for doing something a recipe is task or or, or sorry, a how-to guide is, re is task or problem oriented, same thing. Uh, it serves a practical purpose. Uh, it moves towards a clear objective to obtain some well-defined result. Uh, a a how-to guide 
can only serve the person who has the relevant competence. You give that recipe to a beginner, say, here you are, learn to make cakes. They won't make a cake, they'll just be unhappy. So the how-to guide can only serve the person who has the competence to interpret the how-to guide, to follow those kinds of instructions, to use those kinds of tools and equipment. Unlike a tutorial, the how-to guide has no obligations to the needs of the user. So the purpose, the style, the audience, uh, the needs of a how-to guide should not be confused with those of a tutorial. So the language and the how-to guide should be imperative, okay? If you want to do this, you know, do that. If you want to make a cake, follow this recipe. If you want to build an IKEA wardrobe, follow this how-to guide. If you want to establish a connection to an LDAP server, follow this, read this section. Um, it's only contains action, things to do. And there should be no digression into explanation or trying to teach or so on how we do yeah, we're kind of a little bit behind so i'll take a couple of questions but let's try and keep this short because i i've I, as usual i've managed to go behind so uh, uh edison please yeah i think you were first okay uh, thank you i just wanted to uh get in and ask you how would i love baking so you gave a very good example how would a baking story uh be what would it contain just for context and comparison a baking tutorial yes please yeah funnily enough we've got an exercise coming up later that literally is about uh baking um well i think you would have to think about how you can uh give somebody a set of steps to follow some guidance to follow that is so simple and so bulletproof that at the end of it they came up with something that would give them confidence to try again so it would have to be a very simple kind of bread, for example, um, it, using very easily obtainable ingredients. So, and it would be less optimal than a, a lesson with somebody in the room to correct your course as you're going along. Does that help, Edison? Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. And fair enough. You had a question. Yeah, so <clears throat> my question is, where would you put the Stack Overflow questions? Like, like clearly often the user is interested in achieving something, so it's kind of like a how-to, but oftentimes they don't have the competitive or experience, because that's why they pose the question, because they don't understand how well, the system works. Um, usually, I think, you know, if you were going to take that material and tidy it up and put it into documentation, most of the time it would end up being in a how-to guide. It's somebody wants to solve a particular problem or accomplish a particular task. Nobody goes to Stack Overflow saying, teach me, build in me the skills to do such and such. Sometimes they're asking for explanation or less rarely for reference material, but mostly it's how-to guides. Yeah, but then doesn't that mean that they, they don't actually have the, what, what you'd call it, they already are knowledgeable about the subject? Yeah, I mean, how to guides, but I wouldn't call Stack Overflow documentation in any case. It's not documentation. It's, it's, you know, but it's the kind of question that people often have in their minds that when they come to documentation, looking at how to guides. Um, Simon, I'll come to you in a second. There was a question that I saw uh, Anderson said, somebody said, oh, oh yeah, why 90% of the energy should be used in tutorials rather than how-to guides? Because how-to guides are much, much easier to write. Just, and it, they will be like that. They, they, people tend to like writing how-to guides. They don't bang their heads on them so much. Simon, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I spend a lot of time building command line tools and thinking about the dash dash help option. And I've been trying to think in my head if that's reference or if it's a how to guide, because it kind of, so I always in include examples in the help app of how mm. to run the commands, that kind of thing. Well, it could be either. And because it, it's, if it's coming out of the, the command prompt, you might have to, you might have to, 
what this could help you there is maybe separate just your paragraphs of how to examples and so on from your paragraphs of, of reference. Maybe you need to do both. Okay. Maybe you even need to have explanation in there as well. Who and knows? that kind of happens automatically because I use click and it'll put all of the command line options in a reference format at the bottom of the command. But then I can stick a bunch of text, text, text on before that. This is why I say dear taxes is not about four boxes. It's not that you, you must be this thing and it must be that. But think about when you're writing a sentence, what is this sentence for? And does it belong with these other sentences? Yeah. Edison, did you have your hand up still? Uh, or can, can we move on? Um, Bernard, you too? OK, let's move on. No, okay, I reference. don't. Thank you. Okay. Uh, reference, very easy. It's information oriented. It responds to the user's need to have accurate information that they can rely on in their work. It's concerned. So it's about the theoretical knowledge that somebody who is working needs. So um, the encyclopedia entry for an ingredient is a good example. It well, in, it's not. A it's a technical description. In software, reference is a technical description of the machinery. This part is that size and connects to that part. And the bolt must be tightened to such and such a uh, um, uh, talk. Um, no, the code is not the reference. Um, that's the only purpose of uh, 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 reference material to give these, this description of the machinery and, and its functioning um, in a complete and correct way. So you think about, you know, if you found a tutorial a recipe in an, in, in an encyclopedia, it would be out of place. Um, and the style is, has to be very authoritative. So it's this ref, uh, information oriented uh, technical description. It's the, the truth, the whole truth. It exists to help people do their work. It should be free of distractions from its purpose. It should be austere, uncompromising, boring. It's governed by principles of neutrality and objectivity and factuality. And it's often really helpful to have it structured according to the structure of the machinery itself. So if you're, you know, you're, you've got a method that belongs to a class and to a module, structure the documentation like that as well. So it can serve as a map with a one-to-one -one spatial, almost like a spatial mapping of the two to each other to help people navigate them uh, around them. And finally, explanation. Um, this serves our study. This is not when we're working. This is when we are consolidating or building or acquiring our knowledge and skill. And it's on the theoretical uh, side. It answers the user's need to understand their craft in depth and context by discussing it. It it's illuminates the whole of the, the craft. I don't know if anyone's read uh, Harold McGee. This is on food and cooking. It's not recipes, it doesn't teach you anything but it opens up this subject of food and cooking in the kitchen. It's concerned with the art, the science, the history, the cultural significance of food and cooking and eating. Um, so it's discussion at, at some other level. Um, it's literally concerned with unfolding, with spreading out, you know, explanation uncovers things that have been hidden in the folds of the matter. That's even where the word explanation comes from, from the word, if anyone speaks French, please, the folding. So it discursively illuminates and clarifies some topic. It's understanding oriented. It offers context. It can establish connections. It answers the needs of the person who wants to know more. It deepens this theoretical appreciation or understanding of a practical craft. It can include the bigger picture, the history, how we got here, choices, alternatives, and possibilities. It can discuss bad ways to do it you know, for, to show why they're bad. Um, it can give reasons and justifications and say, well, you could choose maybe this way or this way is better, but you know, these are the pros and cons of each. It's not information. It's not telling you that X is this and Y is that. It's saying, this is how we see things. So this is the map that we get from Diataxis, which is very clear and beautiful. But you can see that just as the, those axes separate things from each other, they pull them together as well. There's this internal gravity. Tutorials and how-to guides are forever being mixed up with each other because they both contain 
contain practical steps. That's the worst case, but it happens everywhere else as well. People in tutorials, they know that this is all about learning and acquiring or, or knowledge of study. So they, in the tutorial, think, oh, I, I have to explain. It's wrong of me not to explain, but it's as out of place in a tutorial as it is to talk about what proteins do when you're teaching a five-year-old how to scramble eggs. And that's why most documentation looks like this. So we've got a map and we have a compass because the ataxis is an approach. It's a way of doing it. It's not four boxes. Here's a kind of truth table for um, understanding it. And um, we're going to go to another exercise. So uh, someone's got a question. Please go ahead while I, while I <clears throat> try and adjust this. This is Jim Delahunt. Um, a question about access patterns to the different kinds of information. I have the sense that um, access reference material is accessed by the user to a particular leaf note, a particular detail when the user needs it. The user does not read the reference all the way through from beginning to end. A tutorial seems like the author very much directs the user where to start and the user will go all the way through to the end. A how-to, the user may choose which how-to to consult but then the user will go through to the end. Absolutely. In, in the case of the how-to, the user is the one in charge. They're asking the questions. In the, in the tutorial, we, the teacher, are the ones who's in charge. Um, and then the explanation, it seems like it could, it could be that the user will pick a section of the explanation to read through because they need that, or it could be that the user will read the entire ex set of explanations from beginning to end because they really want to understand the whole thing. That, that, that's, that's actually really perceptive because um, you know, those are the only relationships that occur diagonally. Tutorials and reference, I, I'm, I wrote the, the, the software, I'll tell you what you need to know about the machinery and its functioning. And the tutorial, I will tell you what I think you need to know. But how to guides and explanation, they both come out of the user's questions more than my prescriptive idea of what the user needs. So um, let me just give you, uh, because I forgot to paste this earlier. Um, I want to give you that little truth table here. So I'm gonna paste this into the chat again. Um, there you are, it's in the chat now. Okay, so this is, this is the compass. And let's use this to go back to the exercise that we were doing before here, okay? So now stop using your intuitions, okay? Because intuitions are great, but they get me, sometimes they're obvious. The difference between a how-to guide and explanation, I can, I very rarely get that mixed up. But I can fall back onto my compass at any time to give me the correct orientation. So let's do that over here. First of all, um, the uh, link didn't come through in the chat. The link didn't come through. Oh, no, I sent a direct message just to, to, to one person somehow. Oh, that think... happens all the time in Zoom. It's really frustrating. You have okay. to change it to right. everyone again. Okay. All right. So here it is. And well, I'm sorry if I've been sending private messages. I haven't been sending many, any messages, actually. Uh, everyone. Okay. There is the message. Okay. So there, open, your, open up the compass and have that in somewhere and then have a look at this. Here's a checklist. First of all, let's do the easy part. Theoretical or practical, please. But just shout it out. You're, you're not, uh, normally in school, you're not allowed to shout out, but in my classroom, you are invited to shout out. Practical or theoretical? Practical. I agree, okay. And is it serving work, something that we've got to do, or is it serving study, something we want to understand or? Learn. Work. 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 Okay, so what kind of material is it? How to. How to. Okay, I agree. Put, put just stick your initials um in, in the box. Okay. All right, and then we'll do the same thing again now. So, what's the difference between Phillips and Posi drivers and Posi drive screwdrivers and screw heads? 
Okay, so this is a question, and uh, it's not uh, it's not it's not a piece of documentation, but it's a situation. Now, before you start using your intuitions, practical or theoretical, use the compass. Theoretical. Does anybody doubt that? Uh, Ned, you look doubtful. <laughs> I am, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzling over whether, I mean, it might be practical in the sense that I literally need to know the difference right now because I have something in my hand, but. Okay, but yeah, the, you know, supposing we complete this cycle by somebody giving you the answer. At that point, everything will have remained in our heads, won't it? Nothing will actually have been done. True. So I think we agree that it's um, uh, theoretical and some of you are jumping ahead, but I want you to stop and ask this question. Um, is it going to serve our study or serve our work? Study. I, I, study. I, I think so. I, I think I, did somebody doubt, did somebody, sorry, somebody worried about that? Okay. Uh, I, I am pretty much for the same reason uh, Ned was before, because even if say it's, it's theoretical knowledge, if I'm just reading this because I was wondering about it, then I would say clearly it's study. But if I see a screw and think, or see, actually this happened to me a few days ago, I, I looked into my bit set and saw um Phillips and I think those Japanese cross screwdrivers and I was wondering which one am I supposed to use so then it would be work more wouldn't it no it would be work if you were looking up a table of you know maybe you had the the patterns and you looked one up and you said and you looked you compared it and you said oh this is a type positive you know this is a type x59.3 size oh i measured against the rule it's a size that would be reference that then that would be work mm -hmm. but here it's what's the difference in in general you know reference would be do i have any books here with tables of reference um then in my list um let's just keep going i mean you know again like a compass you have to get used to using have a look at that that uh, uh the stuff at that url there um first of all Compass, practical or theoretical? Practical. Practical. And is it about work or about study? Study. Doing work. 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 It, it I think says it's how to in the title, and it you're looks not like trying to do a, to make a particular thing. You're trying to knit. You're, you're trying to knit, but are you trying to knit? Are you trying to accomplish something, or is this to? You'll follow the videos, and it'll show you how to load the stitches onto the knitting needle and fumble around, and and says, "Oh, don't worry, you'll get it wrong. Of course, it's going to look wonky, but never mind." you just do these things I, I for me it, that one is 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 study it's a tutorial to, to me it seems like the purpose is to introduce the reader to knitting it's not how to do this specific knitting project it's the the real purpose is introducing the reader to knitting and getting them to like it and, and follow up. In, i think that's really right getting them to like it i think that's a really important concept in documentation in tutorials getting people to like things simon is it yes, you that feels this, uh yes but i put it in the wrong place i, I meant to okay. put it in the tutorial oh, okay okay no, no, no. i um, think it's one of those things where it's clear that this is a tutorial but i have a hard time this like i can always go backwards and say this is study but i, I have a hard time choosing between work and study often because work it, is occurring yeah, well, of course, stuff is being done. Yes, there. I mean, right. think, of so that, like, making, think of the child helping in the kitchen. The meal's going to get done. Something is going to come out of it. But right. it doesn't really matter if it's not, you know, a perfect souffle or, or 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 whatever. It does that doesn't matter so much. What's why? Why are we doing this? What do we want to come out? Gear down, engine in up. Um, from the uh, quick reference handbook of an for an airline. 
Um, it's a bit difficult to read maybe because of the size, I don't know if, if that's large enough for you to peer into it. Um, maybe you'll make it a bit bigger. Um, is this theoretical or practical? Practical. Practical. Theoretical. Theoretical. I think it's theoretical because it doesn't give me any instructions. It just it's just information that stays in my head. I, I would use it for work. Well, I've spoilt it now. I've, I've given the game away. <laughs> <laughs> um, would we use this for study or for work? Um, this is Jim. I'll say it's practical. Um, it's intended where you're in a situation and you look at this page and use it to decide what to do next. And that's, um, I, there's an acronym QRH, which I believe stands for Quick Reference Handbook, which yeah. means you're, you're doing work. Your airplane is in the middle of the sky. You want it to stay in the middle of the sky. And therefore you look at this page to help decide to do the next step to take to keep it in the sky. Yeah. Well, and, and, go on, sorry, somebody was well, saying something. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me because T most QRH content is heavily how-to oriented. It's highly, it's a stir, but it's highly focused on a specific task of getting that airplane safely from wherever you are to the ground or safely through the phase of flight that you're in in an emergency situation. Um, but in this case, to me, this looks like a reference because it's not a series of steps to execute to um, to ensure the plane, you know, stays in the air. It's providing reference, theoretical reference material, the theoretical uh, performance data. Um, that it's not something the user is going to step through step by step. It, they're going to simply I, reference quickly. They're going to consult, not read. I believe you're right. They're going to, uh, as, sorry, it was, um, is it Jim who was talking? Uh, yeah, Jim was saying, you'll use this in your work. You'll rely on it, on this. And that's exactly what reference is. It's not telling me what to do. I still have to interpret this. You know, I can't even understand what, I can't, you, I have to know how to interpret that information. This is, you know, you've got your gear down, you've got an engine not functioning, and this is about uh, the range and so on available to you at different flight levels, uh, I guess. So, oh shit, I'm at, this has happened, I'm at this flight level, oh, this is how I've got to adjust my remaining flying time. So I'll use it, it's ref, I, th I think that's, that's, that, that's reference. Jim, I hope you feel this reference too now. Um, I am persuaded. The <laughs> how-to part is actually in the pilot's head. And they're consulting this reference. Ooh, to fill well, come on, problems. look. Let's go back to screwdrivers, okay? So, uh, who's had the doubt about screwdrivers? Never mind your intuitions. Put your intuitions aside. Use the compass. Practical or theoretical? Theoretical. Or another way. You know, is this happening in the head or with the hands? Theoretical, because you yeah. you look at them and see the difference. Basically. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. contrast this with the earlier question about, you know, tell me the difference between the screwdrivers. Is this going to be something I might use while working with those tools or when I'm learning about them or studying, acquiring knowledge about them? Probably while you are learning. I would say more work because it's it, it 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 seems like the aim is less to teach about screwdrivers, but rather to I don't know, it's kind of hard, but it but it gives specific um specific schematics of what the screw should look like when you're practically working with them I... as opposed to teaching, but I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, to, I, say it's... I think it's not an easy one, this one, but I think it's more like, it doesn't feel like reference. It, it's it's not, sorry, it doesn't feel like explanation because it's not expanding. It's not illuminating. It looks like something I'd, I, I'd look at the screw and hold it up to that and say, well, what kind of screw have I got? Oh yeah, that matches up to that. So this must be a such and such screw. It looks like information that I would consult when I were working. Because if you're like me, I'll, I'll look at this and then I'll forget it five minutes later. <laughs> It's not something that would build up in me to acquire the skills. Sorry, I interrupted. I think it was Florian, if I'm not mistaken, but maybe it was somebody else. Yeah, I was thinking it would be a clearer situation if it was something like those uh, hardware maintenance manuals you get for ThinkPad laptops, where they list every single screw in a schematic of the laptop and tell you right. what size it is and what uh, torque to use. Yeah. That That's would clearly be a work situation then. 
Look, here's another quick reference handbook example, okay? Um, practical or theoretical, please? Practical. I agree. Anyone, anyone, anyone disagrees, shout out now. Would this I is more typical, this seems like more typical CureH content that yeah. you probably ex would expect, Jim. Is this going to serve my study or my work? Work. Work, work in an emergency, as it turns out. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you remember I was saying that about the form of the how-to guide about free of distractions of explanation and reference and so on? Look at this. It's reduced to the absolute minimum. We don't know what this situation is. There could be many other things going on, but we want the user to be who's competent, who has to be competent. No tutorial. You know, this is not a tutorial. If anybody's in, in anybody is in any, any doubt, this is not a learning experience. This is what you have on your lap when things start to go horribly wrong and you want no distractions of the kind that belong in tutorials or any of the other parts of documentation. So yeah, I, I think that's a, a very obvious how-to guide. Oh, here's another aviation related one. Is this practical or theoretical? Theoretical, I had, I had somebody say, is this something that I would use at work or to expand my my knowledge to acquire more skills and understanding. So it's study. Looks like study. Yeah. So it means study. it's explanation. And here's another one. Maybe you don't have no idea what this even means, but does it look practical or does it look theoretical? Just look at the verbs. I don't even know which are the verbs in this text that you know. This is practical. <laughs> it's practical. Practical, okay. And does this look like it's, you know, is this a learning experience? It's it doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like a learning experience. So it must be. How to. It's a recipe for knitting something. So this is, this you know, comparison is, it's, this is a comparison with that other knitting example that we had about, you know, your first knitting project. This is, oh, you. If you you could follow that in those instructions, you'd probably come up with the with the same thing as even if you didn't know what it was supposed to be. Um, and here's a I, I didn't even this is a, I just found this I didn't even know what this was until a few days ago. Okay. Actually, I mean, do, does that does that is it clear whether that's practical or theoretical? That is practical. That's practical. Uh, who said that? Uh, I did. Okay. Do you know what this is? I I believe this is also for knitting. I'm not it's totally a, sure. Yeah. It's a knitting. It's a how-to guide for knitting. It's a knitting. Yeah. It's, it doesn't this look. Looks, like, this looks like cable knitting to me. But you know, it doesn't look like a how-to guide because it doesn't contain any instructions that I recognize. But if you know that language, if you know the, if you're competent and can follow those. In, those are instructions that apparently are read from right to left. And it's another way of giving instructions in knitting. Well, I thought that was really interesting. I, I, I'd never encountered that before. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we look back at some of these, uh, sorry, some of these slides here, using the compass rather than the intuitions, we can hone in very, very accurately on the kind of stuff that we're dealing with much more accurately when, than we're, when we're using our intuitions, which, you know, we love using them, but they are un, not unreliable exactly, but they can lead us astray. Any questions or observations about that before we uh, move on? I've got some more exercises for you that will bring things out. Uh, yes, hand up over there. Yeah, it, it's Cam. Um, just just a quick um, and 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 perhaps Erlen and Ezio can also echo this, but I think it, it's it is very it can be very challenging at first sometimes to identify what goes with what, but with with time and with experience with practical learning, um, it it does seem to get, and also with the the kind of thinking of the two dimensions separately rather than convolving them and trying to intuit it all at once it, it does bi uh, gradually build intuition that that can that can 
help one decide. Although still, uh, it, it still seems like in the tougher cases, it's more reliable to ask both questions because it avoids having to solve a two-dimensional problem as opposed to a one-dimensional problem. But once once one does have more experience, as we've been slowly doing with the C Python documentation, um, it it does for the for the more obvious cases, it does get qu quicker on the intuition front. It seems like to to grasp this, even though at first it may seem very challenging and even unintuitive. But, um, but 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 it really does help having those splitting off the two dimensions. Um, I want to very brief. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I I still fall back on my uh, on my uh, compass regularly. Um, I want to go back to that question about experience and lack of experience as this why that's not a distinction between tutorials and how to guides. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you a, a, a little story okay you are an anesthetist with many years of experience and like all good medical professionals clinical clinicians you'll go back into training sometimes and maybe you'll go in a course and they'll put you in the simulation room and you'll in the simulation room they have these little not little they've got these wired up but they look like bodies and they're wired up to all the machines and so on. You know, they have blood pressures and uh, body temperatures and oxygen levels and all this kind of stuff. And you can do things to these um, dummies, except they're extremely smart, the, these things. And uh, maybe you're doing a, a course on advanced neonatal anesthesia you know, for, for anesthesia on very small babies. So it's, it's, it's a, a specialized thing and you'll go into the simulation room and now, well, you'll be doing stuff. So is that practical or theoretical? It's very much practical. You're going to be doing stuff all day, you know, pumping chests and uh, in, uh, administering drugs. Is it for work or is it for study? Well, Clearly, it's for study. You're not; these are not real patients. You're not applying your skills. You're building your skills. So, your that experience is a tutorial experience in the simulation room. The tutors are giving you a learning experience. Is it for beginners? Absolutely not. You cannot do advanced neonatal anesthesia until you're already a very competent physician. Right. I guess the, the the way I was thinking about it is not so much their experience. There's sort of levels of levels of field, right? There's the entire field of anesthesia in which they are an expert. There's the field, the subfield of neonatal anesthesia in which they are a beginner. And I guess when I think about tutorials and experience, I think of like in the thing that the tutorial is trying to teach, you do not have practice. No, you, let me give another. Okay, you're a pilot. A commercial pilot with many thousands of hours of experience and you will periodically go back into training you again you'll go into a simulator you will practice engine out landings which maybe you've done for real many times but you will go there for training purposes to have that learning experience in the hand safely in the hands of the tutor where nothing can go wrong i mean mm -hmm. you know maybe you'll injure your 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 pride a bit at worst, yeah, but you'll be in this situation where the tutor knows what's going to happen. And this is for building up your skill through the experience. Whereas the how-to guide that you follow as, as a pilot will be, oh, well, I'm spoiling the next slide now, but uh, let's, let's, let's do this. Come on, we'll, we'll fish it out of here, okay? Yeah. What I want now, and let me get my uh, notes because I always, why do they why does it do that i don't know why it has to do that it's so annoying um look i would like you uh enter full screen what i would like you to do um panel since you're the one with doubts right now i want you to talk me through this example here and tell me why these are good examples of tutorial how to guide reference and explanation or maybe at least for, do for me the, fir the first two, the, the, why is that a good example of a, of a tutorial on the top left? Is, is that meant to be sort of a, actually somebody in, is that a video? Is it like, I don't, uh, no, 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 or is it meant to be just, just that picture? I, yeah, like, I mean, in this situation that's being depicted there, why is I that see. a good depiction of a lesson, 
a learning experience. I mean, obviously, it's not a tutorial exactly because right, right. You know, but, and by the it way, it seems like that, there's a second person there guiding them through that experience, it, which it's safely in the hands of the tutor. Right. Yes. Um, what else? What else can you what do you observe in that situation? Um, it looks like they are you know, they are literally hands on, whereas the tutor is is, is sort of doing the guiding. Um, yeah. The I, tutor's pointing things out. You'll observe such right. and such. Yeah. Right. yeah. By the, way, the people who are working on the SQLite tutorial were talking about this a lot. You know, what should we about the tutors about the students? What the students seeing and so on. So that's good. Yeah. Um, what about the weather outside? It is a very like it's a very clear day, so it's a very safe time to be yeah. doing this practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? What the flight instructor will be saying to this beginner, saying, "Okay, now we need to set the flap. Maybe if it's one of the first lessons, we need to set the flaps to position such and such. Take that lever and push it firmly <laughs> until it clicks into place. The body again. Remember, we're right, talking right. about learning the muscle memory. Muscle memory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's that's good. And you know the pilot's really there to grab the controls. Unlike us, who have to be condemned from our pupils' learning experiences, yeah. Which is why right. our job is much harder than that of the pilot instructor. Um, tell me now, please, about what you see in the top right. It's very small for them. It's very small. Uh, yeah. Um, I think. Yeah. yeah. It looks like it is. It's a checklist. So yeah, um, it is a series of things to do as a part of specific tasks before will, will starting. Your, next time you take a flight, will your pilot maybe skip over, read this on Sunday night before going to bed just to refresh their memory? No, um, they'll run it through while they are actually doing the takeoff. They will do it every single time, no, right. no matter their level of experience. In fact, the beginner pilot might be tempted to not do that. The experienced pilot will follow the checklist because the difference between the how-to guide is work and study and not experience and learning. There is no learning experience on that right-hand side at all. It's about applying it to work. Mm -hmm. That's make you know, it takes a while to tease. Yeah. On the Data Access website, there's a, an overlong page about this distinction between uh, tutorials and how-to guides you know if you've got the stomach you can read it but it's it really deserves to be teased out okay let's yeah. talk to, um i'll just uh, we should hurry along a little bit tell tell me why the bottom right hand example is a good example of reference material and it's very detailed mm, uh, it probably, yeah go on probably no one with that deep knowledge, technical knowledge, will be able to like decipher it of what it can only serve the competent user. Yeah. Um, does it um, tell you what to do? Does it let you know what you're looking for? It, it can give you information to help you. Um, this was Jim's question earlier, I think. It can give you information that helps you decide what to do, but you need to be the one um, who interprets it yeah so you've got a lot of knowledge is required even to interpret this never mind apply it but um it's not going to really build up your appreciation of the craft it's something you're going to use in a certain moment in a certain place while you're at work does any any questions does everyone does that seem to fit with everyone no. and on the left hand side. Um, some kind of discussion, if you like, or some explanation of aerodynamic behavior. Why is that appropriate for that quadrant of the map? It's not necessary to do any of the work, but it gives you a better sense of what's going on and sort of expands your, your understanding. Supposing the student pilot at the top left says, you know, you put the flaps down 
And then the controls start shaking a bit. And they say, oh, the controls are shaking. And supposing the pilot says, the, the instructor says, that's an interesting question. And then starts going into all this stuff about laminar uh, flow and uh, the separation point of the boundary layer. Do, do you think that that explanation is what the slightly anxious learner pilot wants at that moment? Is that going to be helpful? No. No. Yeah. Explanation, the, my rule of thumb, you know, okay, this is one place where it is good to have an intuition. Explanation might be interesting to read in the bath, but a normal person would not want to read any other kind of documentation in the bath, only explanation. I, I know programmers are not always completely normal, but yeah. <laughs> uh, let's very briefly run, very briefly run through this one. Why is this, why are these four good examples? Go on, just shout out. You're welcome to shout out. It's fine in this in this classroom. Well, the first one is clearly a parent teaching their child how to ride a bike. Yeah. The situation is around busy road. Oh no! It looks like it's in a park. It looks safe. Yeah. Literally in the hands of the instructor. The, it would be work if, if it were if the person were on the bicycle were going to be achieving something, but they're not. They're just going around in circles in in, in, in that park. Yeah, and we know they're going to fall off, but it's good to be on the on the grass. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, in one of my other workshops, I asked somebody, "What's the first?" Okay, well, what would what would you do? You know, teaching the. He said, "Well, the first thing I'll do is teach the child how to. I, I'd explain to the child how to balance." I thought, um. No, you won't actually, because you'll just make the child cry if you try to teach the child how to balance. It's, it's so, the child has to learn through the body. And so does the beginner with Django or Python or whatever. They have to learn through the body. You don't think so, but it is the body that they're learning through. It truly, truly is. Uh, it's, that's come, yeah. And I, I suppose it kind of reflects my how I learned to ride a bike, which basically my parents and this like bike instructor just put me on this steep hill and had me ride the bike down the hill and it was not easy and I crashed a lot but the purpose of the, of the lesson was not uh, being a lesson was not how to ride down this one specific hill which would, which would be which would be a high too it was yeah. put me in, in a situation that would allow me to learn the key skills of riding a bike balance pedaling keeping the handlebars steady shifting my weight and and putting myself in different situations that would specifically challenge me and push me to be able to learn. Uh, and, and it was interesting. I, the, 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 the bike instructor had a very interesting philosophy. She didn't like training wheels. She was very against that, but because she felt it didn't give the student the actual experience of riding a bike that would push them to actually learn. And of course the situation was challenging. I was like, I was a little scary and I almost, I, maybe it was a little too scary, but um, it did also, it did also actually motivate learning in the sense that it didn't say here's how to do this, but it put me in a situation that required me to learn through yeah. my tactile experience it, it how, to, how to do these things. And then well, if I could do that, I could do I could do take care of any basic biking task. And if I could do that more challenging task. So maybe it was a little too challenging for a first lesson, but it worked out in the end. I, I've just checked the time and counted up how many minutes we have left and how many I want to spend on the exercise. So I'm going to just rush through this now. But, you know, if you've got something burning inside you, shout out, please. So look, uh, the top right, the how to guide checks before assembly. Look at the language. Make sure the crankshaft is correctly mounted. Um, uh, check the compatibility of the front derailleur. These are instructions that only somebody with competence can even understand. But they are instructions. The mechanic, even the experienced mechanic, working with these particular parts will follow will follow those while working on the bike yeah bottom right here oh this is a good sign of it of reference that if something looks tables and lists of numbers and things they kind of look and smell like uh, they look and smell like reference this is a table of information that i need to look at to uh, guide me when i'm selecting the parts that i'm going to be working with there's a nice warning combinations other than those provided in the, in the table may cause accidents or injury. That's, it's not telling me that I have to do this or that. It's just saying, here's some information that you need to be aware of. And the last one, it's slightly unclear maybe, but if, I'm, if I want to turn to the left on my bicycle, should I apply a force that rotates my handlebars to the left or to the right? Does anybody know? 
you need to go have to turn a bit right to the extent that you apply a force to uh to the extent that you apply a force to the right you you will turn to the left and the harder you turn to the right the more to the left you will go try it i mean you can't explain it your body will learn it long before you have learned it intellectually but when you learn when you appreciate this intellectually it's a deeper level of dimension it's a deeper um, level of understanding about bicycling stuff and you know physicists are still arguing over how and why this works it's quite quite interesting um i'm going to kind of hurry us along now because if that's okay um but you know do, if anybody's got something burning to ask do do say i want to go on to another exercise i want to go okay i've set seven minutes for this one let me give you the link so Ma marietta could you split us into five um breakout rooms is that something you can do Okay, let me try. Okay, so okay. before Marietta, before Marietta, oh, hang on a second. Oh, I want to ask how many breakout rooms? Um, we don't have the link in the chat yet. Sorry, I thought I pasted it. In. There's a problem with somebody's microphone. Is that yours, Marietta? Is that yours, Marietta? Sorry, let me. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. You so, hear me? Okay. Yes. And there's no more feedback. So let me explain what's going to happen in this exercise, okay? Um, here are two examples of ones you've seen already. And I'm going to get Mar Marietta is going to put you in breakout rooms for seven minutes, okay? And um, what I would like you to do is come up with one example for each of the four concept, uh, concepts of how uh, tutorial, how to reference and explanation in the context of playing a musical instrument uh, or woodwork or photography or, or whatever they are. Just come up with one example and your example could be in the form of uh, a line of text or a picture that illustrates something. Does that seem reasonably clear? So, you know, if I'd said, I want four examples from flying, you might have picked up a picture of a student instructor, a checklist, a, a reference map or a table, like as we had in one of the previous exercises and something that explains. I just um, uh, find a quick example of those for each of those. So seven minutes randomly assigned to five different breakout rooms and Marietta, take it away. Those seven minutes went by very quickly. I'm not even, to be honest, perfectly sure if it was seven minutes, but never mind. Okay, great. Um, we're kind of running out of time, but uh, um, I hope you see the examples here. So look, playing a musical instrument, sheet music. It's like a recipe. It's a how-to guide. Um, the tu did everybody find that the tutorial example was the most difficult to think of? Yes. It's, I told you the tutorials are going to give you the most trouble. Oh. How to grasp a, a drumstick. Uh, how to grasp a drumstick. That's good. That's a good example because it's something, you know, it's with the body. It's, you need the teacher there. Um, I'll just skim through a few examples here. Um, here's some reference of different kinds of saw teeth, I think. Yeah. Um, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, an example of a, of a lesson, how to make a chopping board. That could be a how-to guide, but it, depending on how it's presented is going to be the difference between the how-to guide and the tutorial. Is it so that somebody learns these basic skills along, way, along the way, or is it so that they come up with a saleable chopping board? Photography, what does the first one illustrate for? Can you tell me? It's uh, a, that is, yeah. It, um, it, it, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, that is a photography tour. The, the idea being that uh, you have other people there with you 
um, and a tour guide that is bringing you to places to have the experience of taking the pictures, which is what starts your your journey in photography. And I like, I think, great, and I think your other three examples are spot on, the how-to guide, how to develop your film, or ruin it, as I do in my own case, <laughs> uh, a table of developing times, I guess, oh, exposure times, and an explanation of depth of field. Lovely, wonderful. Well, and partic particularly what I liked about the, the bottom two is that they present similar information showing uh, changes in f-stop but in two different two different fr framings one is to show one is a reference you know here's what f-stops use with these shutter speeds or whatever and the other one is actually showing the effect explaining the effect of uh, f-stop on the image one you will read in the bath and one you won't um plumbing oh I, I assume this is somebody's my first welding lesson so where you will end up with uh uh, a hideous mess of a joint, but at least you also you won't have uh, you won't have uh, caused any damage. Um, I think that's exactly um, the Yeah, great. Um, the diagram actually that could possibly be referenced depends on on what it's on what it's serving, what need it's meeting. You know, you can't always tell just by looking at it. But if you yeah. thought that it was to meet the need of understanding more deeply, then that is explanation the that we put that in but i can see how this could be design your thing as this or stuff like that yeah or maybe it's it's you know oh this is your system and this is exactly the parts in it it could yeah. be that it could be a map of the system yeah. and chess nice example there no stress chess uh yes great a learning experience um opening gambits yeah the technical reference of the moves, evaluation, fine, great. These are lovely examples. I think you've got it. Um, look, our next exercise, I've put 12 minutes here. We don't even have 12 minutes left. Marietta, let's do, I will, no, let's not try and rush the exercise. I will give you the links. You can try this by yourself. It's always more fun to do it in a group. We just don't have the, the time. So I think that's what we'll do. The idea here is to choose a craft or skill and to come up with some documentation for it. Now, again, the tutorial, if you, if you spend 10, 12 minutes on it, spend six minutes on the tutorial and six minutes on everything else put together. Okay. The tutorial, I'd actually like you to come up with a tutorial that guides somebody through, for example, making coffee. You'd have to decide what it is. My my choice will be your first cup of coffee. And now think about what you're going to put in that. Also, I would say with for the tutorial, start with the final step and and then decide how you're going to get there. And think about in the tutorial what experience you're going to create. You know, is your tutorial going to be advanced coffee patterns you know with your steamed milk or is it going to be your first cup of instant coffee with the minimum experience you know maybe it's not the really the best way to do it but as long as it's something that results in some kind of achievement might be worth while so uh this idea of the end to end learning experience the happy path as i think was somebody said that's what we want to deliver so you'll notice that for the tutorial i've given a clue with numbers there because we want to be really didactic to follow the steps in this order to that end for the others i don't i just want examples of some how-to guide titles some reference article titles some explanation titles and there are a bunch of different things here. Somebody was asking about bread. I think bread's in there somewhere. Making bread. So, you know, bread's one of the options for you. This is some documentation for a fictional turtles implementation. And it's not really complete. And you can see bits where it's been, where I've simply stopped writing so they don't write unnecessary stuff. But it could be good documentation, um, but the structure is very bad. And the structure is bad because it mixes up the stuff. Okay, you can, 
Um, so your job there would be to make a, a copy of it and then improve the structure. That just means moving sections of the text around and maybe changing or or editing the hit just the headings, not the content of the of the material. Um, so you don't need to change any inline content. So you, you, you know the map, you've got the compass, this little truth table here, and you should be able to go into that document and move things around and give it a better structure. And that would be interesting. We'll look at this at the beginning of Thursday's workshop. And we'll compare notes. And we'll also look at how we go about the business of doing it. So this is, will take us into this question of, you know, somebody, was it Marietta who asked how we uh, refactor documentation when we've got something that needs to be restructured? And that's how we'll start next, next um, workshop. So just make your own copy of this. And I don't think you've got edit, you shouldn't have edit access to this one. Um, uh, good. Anyone can view it, but nobody else can edit it. Great. Um, and, and see how you get on with that. And let's just use, use the five official minutes for any questions or observations people have. Listen, I'm going, I think I'm going to wrap up now because we've been uh, we've been at this for nearly two and a half hours, which is pretty respectable. Um, thank you, Marietta, for setting it all up. And thank you all for being here. I hope I'll see at least some of you on Thursday for the next part. And by the way, you know, today has been about this is how you do documentation, this is the right way, this is what makes it good, and I'm giving you all these tough things to cry about, like ways of writing tutorials and so on. And on Thursday, I will show you how to make everything easy and not your problem, okay? So I'll pay, I'll pay you back for everything that you've had to uh, shell out for today. Cool, thanks a lot, Daniel, this was fantastic. I'll see you on Thursday. It was, it was really enjoyable Thank for you, me. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Daniele. Yeah. Bye.